Well, good morning and welcome to the Well Church. We are so glad that you would be able to connect with us online, and we are, we are very much looking forward to having a, an awesome time of worship and hearing from God's Word. Uh, before I do, I just want to let you know that you can fill out a connection card online. It's found at the, the wellukaipa.com under the events page, and right there at the bottom, you can fill out one of these. Uh, this is a good way of, for us connecting with you and you connecting with us. Also, we would love to know about how we can pray for you as a church. Um, you can fill that out and let us know, and that would just be amazing. I also want to read to you, and for us all to read together, this month's Bible verse. It's 1 John 5.14. It says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 1 John 5.14. Let's pray. Well, God, I just want to thank you for this time that we've been given, this opportunity we've been given to worship you, God. And we can do that here today. We can do that in our homes. We can do that anywhere where two or three are gathered. So I just want to thank you for that opportunity. We want to continue to pray for each and one of our families, that you protect them and guide them during this time. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It is so good to see you. Well, not see you, to be here with you all. And... Um, Today is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's hard to not be rejoicing with this next song that we're about to sing. Um, I just want to encourage you guys this morning. I know it's hard to get engaged sometimes sitting at your, your houses, but um, turn to your neighbor right now if you've got a neighbor in your house and say, I am free to worship. Amen. You are free to worship the Lord this morning, so feel free to clap along. I've talked to all the husbands and wives out there that we're not going to judge each other this morning about <laughs> singing and dancing and clapping or whatever. But, um, yeah, I hope this song encourages you guys as we begin our time of worship.
church. It is an amazing thing that we have a mighty friend in Jesus. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious in anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known before God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We have a friend in Jesus. He hears us. us in this world, we will have troubles. Take heart, he has overcome the world. Let's sing. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? Jesus, Savior, is our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Blessed Savior. Steadfast, never failing, you are faithful. Our creator. 
salvation is in all of who you are. You're the healer of the sick and the broken. You are comfort for every heart that mourns. Our King and our Savior forever. For eternity we will sing of all you've done. For eternity we will sing of all you've done. Stand between us. No 
hands out, church, just our voices. come to a time in our, our service where we continue our worship and we worship the Lord through uh, the time of giving. And um, just as a reminder, um, since we're not here right here together, the way that we can give, there's really two ways. You can go online at www.thewellukaipa.com or you can mail in your tithes and offerings to 12717 14th Street, Ukaipa, California. And we'd love for you to continue on with worship with us. Let's pray and let's ask God to bless these offerings. Father, we are so grateful that we can continue ministry. Um, even though this difficult time is here and it keeps us from being together physically, you are at work, Lord. We pray that you will um, use this um, this broadcast to reach the hearts and of, of many people in this world, Lord. And we ask that each person here today would... Um, um, be blessed by the things that they see um, on this service. So, Lord, we, we ask for your blessing on this offering. We ask for your strength. We ask for your perseverance as we go through this time of, of quarantine together, Lord. Watch over us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. 
never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Lord, you are a, a way maker, miracle worker, a promise keeper. Lord, you are the light in our darkness. And Father, as we keep our eyes focused on you and focused on your son, Jesus, and, and receptive to your Holy Spirit working through us, Lord, as we keep our eye on the word and we keep our eye on, on you leading us through, we see that you are our way maker. And as difficult as things may be in our lives right now, you are the one who is, who is persevering on our behalf, Lord. You're paving the way. And so, Lord, we, we follow you and we trust you and we hold on to you as we walk through this journey that we are on. Thank you, Father, for caring for us. Thank you for loving us. And, and loving us even when we're not together, Lord. You're, you're here in our midst and drawing us close together. And we thank you in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, and we're glad that you're all here today. I want to share a little video with you, and um, I want you to take a look at this as we begin our service today at uh, the preaching part. And yes, we still are the church. And even though we're not meeting face to face at this time, we are still 
together in our spirit, and we still are serving Jesus. And I know that we're going to get through this time of physical distance, and we're going to come out on the other side, on the other side stronger in our commitment to transform our community through the healing love of Jesus Christ. And we will reach the world and raise up faithful followers of Jesus. That is our mission. That is what we are focused on. And even in this time when we can't meet together, that is the direction and that is our focus as a church. Jesus said that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that is a good thing because this is not dependent on your effort or my effort, but it is on Jesus Christ who's building his church. We're part of that church that Jesus is building, and we have a legacy of belief that's gone on for over 2,000 years. And it actually goes back to the very time that Christ instituted this church on the earth. And his church has survived persecution, famine, disease, political oppression, and satanic attack. And his church has prevailed through his power and through his sustaining life poured out in our midst through his Holy Spirit. And we are the people that are the church. I like what that video that we just saw said, it's not about brick and mortar. It's about the people. We are the ecclesia, the called out ones who are destined to take hold of this eternal life. And that is our calling. That is the life to which we are called. So this eternal life that we're, we're going to be talking about today, living the life, it begins now. And it's evidenced by your lives. No matter what your current situation holds, we know that God is at work in us and through us. He's at work in you and through you today. And so today we're going to look at three evidences that you are living the life. We're going to look at these evidences that become clear. And we're going to go back to our study in First John. And uh, we're going to start actually in chapter 5 today. And we're going to see very clearly these evidences that, that the life of God is working through you. And the life that God has called you to and the life that will lead you to the very heart of God. And these evidences were going to be strong. So let's look at these three evidences briefly this morning. And the first one is very simply that you are born again. The, nev- the evidence that God is at work in you is that he is recreating who you are and he has recreated who you are in your spirit and has brought you to life spiritually. And he, as he talked to, to Nicodemus, Nicodemus came to him in John chapter 3, and he had all of these questions for Jesus. And Jesus said, you know, Nick, I, I know what you're getting at, but let's skip through all that stuff, and let's get to the point, the heart of the matter. He said, Nick, you must be born again. And for us, that's the starting place, is when we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, and it changes us from the inside out, and it gives life to our dead spirit. And at that point, when you receive Christ and your spirit is renewed, then you are born again. So let's take a look here at verses 1 through 5 of chapter 5 in 1 John. Verse 1 says this, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. Um, you, you know what Jesus' commands are, and we talk about it in church all the time. It's love God and love people. Love the Lord Jesus, love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That is the call. Those are the commands of Jesus. And that is what we are to be doing in this difficult time. And it's really difficult when we're kind of stuck together with those who you really love. Sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to lead that out and to live it out. But that is the call of God in our lives. And this is love for God to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. 
For everyone born of God overcomes the world. If you're born of God, if you are born again, you overcome the world because these commands of God are not that burdensome. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. And when we would put our faith in Christ, we have the power to carry out the command of Christ. And that command is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And when you put your trust in God, then you're able to do that. Verse 5 says, who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. So the first evidence is that you are a believer and you are born again. So there, there's a few things in these passages that we saw. Um, the, the first one is that you believe that Jesus is the Christ. If you're born again, you believe that Jesus is the Christ. Now, Christ is a transliteration of a, of a Greek word, Christos, which means the anointed one. Uh, the Hebrews were, were looking for the Messiah, The one who would set all things right in the world. And that is Christ. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? The one who came to forgive your sin and to set up God's rule and reign in this earth. You believe and you receive that gift that the Father offers in Jesus Christ. When you're born again, you believe in Jesus. And when you believe in Jesus, you're born again. That's the the progression of it. Do you believe? This morning, do you believe, have you received Christ as your Savior, committed your life to follow after him? If you haven't done that, I, commit, I just pray right now that you will pray to the Father and tell him that you believe, confess your sin, turn from your sin, and follow after Jesus this morning. So if you're born again, you believe Jesus is the Christ. Also, if you're born again, you keep Jesus' commands. Verses 2 and 3 tell you that, that you need to keep those commands. And if you're born again, you, you, you hold on to these commandments. And what are the commands? It's very simple. There's not a whole lot of rules to the Christian life. It's simple. It's two things. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you, 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 you love God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two commands. And all of the law is kept in those two things. Now, I said that it is simple, but it certainly is not easy. In order to do that, you really need to be born again. You need to have a spiritual experience with God. Have you turned your life over to God? And it's only then that you will be able to keep Jesus' commands if you're born again. If you're living the life of God, you're increasing in your love for him and others. You may not be perfect in your love for God yet. You may not be perfect in your love for your neighbors yet. But as you grow in grace and as you grow in your relationship with God, you will find that your capacity to love God and love your neighbors is is growing each day. So you believe Jesus is the Christ, you keep Jesus' commandments. And the third thing, if you're born again, you are living the overcoming life. Does that mean that you never have trouble? No. Does it mean that you never have sorrow? No. Does it mean you never have grief? No. Does it mean you never sin? No, it doesn't mean any of those things. But what it does mean is that day by day, you're putting to death the deeds of the flesh, the the life that's lived in opposition to God. You're putting that to death and you're following Jesus more and more. And you're getting little victories along the way as you are living this overcoming life. And it says in our passage above that, that who overcomes this world is only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And you see the progression here as we, as we grow in Christ. We, we believe and then we grow and then we lead and we, and we overcome more and more. So that's the first evidence that you are um, a Christian, that you're living the life is that you're born again. The second evidence is that you believe that Jesus came as a real man. Proper doctrine is really important for Christians because we need to formulate our life based on reality and not just stuff that we make up. Everyone, it seems, has their own opinion of who God is. But for us, for those who know God, our opinion of God and our our perception of God is formed and solidified by our trust 
and reliance upon the scriptures. Because if we start making up who our God is, we start making up all kinds of weird stuff. And it's not, it looks like some crazy scene from Talladega Nights where I love the little baby Jesus and I love this kind of Jesus and I love that kind of Jesus. What we need to do is formulate our opinion of who Jesus is based solely upon what the scriptures reveal to us. Look at verses 6 through 8 in 1 John 5. It says, This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. Now, now, we're going to explain what that means in just a second. Because when I read that, and I don't know about you, but I read that, I'm thinking, what in the world is John talking about? In fact, some of your, your older translations, like the King James add in a couple other things, we'll come back to that in just a second. But, but this is kind of strange. He, he did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it's the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. We want to get down to the truth of things. We need to make sure that we have the Spirit of God that's leading us along to interpret these scriptures. Verse 7, For there are three that testified, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. So what's going on here in verses 7 and 8? And it's a little bit, um, a, a little strange. This, this little section of scripture is called the Kama Johannium. And the comma Johannium, it means John's comma. And um, people like to use Latin when they're talking because it makes them sound smarter, I think. But really, it just means John's comma. There's something that's put in here. And in most modern translations of the Bible, like the NIV or the New American Standard or the ESV, 1 John 5, 7 and 8 says, For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three are in agreement. However, some of the older translations, most notably the original King James Version of 1611, includes an additional clause in verse 7 here um, that we have written down that makes a clear reference to the Trinity. And it says, For there are three that bear record. In heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Now, why is that different? When I first became a Christian, the only Bible that everyone was reading was the King James Version. And I kept wondering... What was the problem with people believing in the Trinity? Because this lays it out pretty clear. The Father, the Holy Ghost, and the Son. And then I I look and the newer versions as they came out didn't have that verse in there. And I said, well, what's going on? Are they taking stuff out of the Bible? And some people that believe in a King James only translation would say that's what they're doing. Well, the reality of this is this is one of those little small places in the scriptures and, and that, that people have inserted something in and it's very clear in, a, in the 1500s. Um, the, the problem here with this is this didn't even appear in the older manuscripts until about the 1500s. Some overzealous copyist before they had printing press wrote in the margin of one of the translations Oh, look at this. And and you know how you write in the margins of books sometimes? And some of you even write in the margins of your Bible. Someone did that as they were translating. Well, someone came across that copy and they said, Oh, this must have been in there. And then he started inserting it in after the 1500s. And not only did it appear then, but then it was added and kept in there for political reasons. And that's another whole other thing. We could talk for an hour about the politics that went into this one verse. And it was crazy. But what happened actually is the older text, the ones that up until the, the, the 14 or 1500s didn't have this phrase in it, and then it was added in. And so the newer translations have gone back with better manuscripts, the ones that are closer to the originals, and they've taken this verse out. And so when they put this one in, it basically said this, and, and, and they took out the part that was erroneous, and it says what we have in our modern-day translations, the NIV and New American Standard in the ESV, for there are three that testified, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. Now, okay, so that clears up one part of it, but the second part of it is, what about the spirit and the water and the blood? That just seems really kind of weird to me 
And, 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 and what in the world is John talking about right here? Well, let's go back and let's remember who John was. John was an eyewitness to all of these things that were going on. He was an eyewitness. He saw Jesus' life from his baptism to his death. Jesus was most likely a follower of John the Baptist. And when he saw Jesus baptized, he left John the Baptist and followed after Jesus, as was Jesus' attention all along. And most scholars agree that this is a reference to both Jesus' baptism and his crucifixion. Let's look at a couple of verses that will clear this up. Um, First of all, the reference to his baptism. Another eyewitness, Matthew, in Matthew 3, 16 and 17, he wrote, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. And so you see in this reference, we see very clearly there's a, 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 a testimony of the water and the spirit. The testimony of the water when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came and spoke. Um, and, and, and the voice from heaven, which was the father, said, this is my son whom I love and whom I'm well pleased. And see, we see this is the testimony of the water and the spirit at that time. That was a testimony of his baptism. But we also see the other end of Jesus' life in his crucifixion on earth. In John 19, uh, remember John who wrote 1 John also wrote the Gospel of John. And in John 19, verses 34 and 35, John wrote this. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. So you see here an eyewitness, John, is is writing that this was the blood and the water. Verse 35, the man who saw it has given testimony and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth and he testifies so that you also may believe. See, John himself was saying, listen, I saw it. And this was the testimony. I saw Jesus get baptized. I saw the spirit come down. I saw Jesus get stabbed in the side with the spear. I saw the blood and the water. And I saw these these themes of, of, of the blood and the water and the spirit. And John weaves these themes together through these two these two stories. So I was wondering, why did John write that in there? Why was it so important that he talked about the blood and the water and the spirit? Well, the reasons for this were real clear about what was going on in the society at that time. There was a a lot of heresy that was beginning to be taught in the church that Jesus wasn't really a man. That Jesus was only a spirit. And that error is called Gnosticism. And what the Gnostics would say was that since he was just a spirit, and since we are really just spirits, it really doesn't matter what we do with our bodies as long as our spirit is right with God. And you might be thinking, well, Pastor, why are you teaching me about the Gnostics? Because I see that error at work in the church right now. Not necessarily our church, but maybe. And people are saying, it doesn't really matter what I do with my body as long as I'm right with God. Well, my friends, Jesus came as a man to this earth and he was fully God and fully man. And the error says that Jesus was only a spirit. But the truth is that Jesus was fully a man with his body. And Jesus lived a sinless life here on earth. And the call for God is for our bodies to be the temple of God. That's where Jesus resides now, through his spirit. In our lives, our physical bodies are the temple of God, just as Jesus in his body was the temple of God while he was living here. And so we see that it's important that we have the proper um, teaching that Jesus was fully a man. 
And in his humanity, he didn't sin. And so he could be an offering of our sin. And he could pay the penalty for our sins because he was fully a man. And he lived his life without sinning. We see a person's testimony about Jesus. And we see God the Father's testimony regarding Jesus. If you're living the life, your testimony will agree with Scripture and the testimony of John. Jesus was God present in the flesh. He was fully God, fully human, living a sinless life so he could be a sinless sacrifice for the for the sins of all mankind. And see, that is the importance of Jesus being here. And so John was stressing that Jesus was no mere spirit who was some ghost who came here on the earth. He was truly a man of flesh and bones, but truly God at the same time. But you don't have to take a man's word for this. And this is kind of the third evidence here um, uh, for you to follow. You born again, you believe that Jesus was fully man, you have a good doctrine of, of who Jesus is. And the third evidence in your life that you're living a life is that you believe the Father's testimony about the Son. And this is probably the most important because not just it's just not some man's opinion, but this is God the Father speaking about his Son. And this is crucially important that we listen to that. If we go to 1 John 5, verses 9 and 10, John says this, and he just talked about his testimony. He just talked about how he was an eyewitness to these things. But then he moves on in verse 9. He says, we accept human testimony. But God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his son. It's important that we think about what we say and the things that we say to others, and it holds some weight. Do you know that the things that you say to your neighbors and your friends and your families have impact on them? Because they know you, and they know that you're following God, and they know that you're a person of integrity. And even a court of law, if they hear you testifying, if you swear to tell the whole truth, that testimony is assumed to be true. However, we have God's testimony, which is greater because it's from God. And and, and, and so many times in our life, we, we listen to this expert or that expert. And the reality is the testimony of God is the one that is most important. Verse 10 says, whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. If you believe in Jesus, you accept the testimony of God the Father. Whoever does not believe in God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about the sons. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, I just want to say to you right now, that as you are standing before God, you are standing as a man on this earth, as a creature of God, as a creature who has been created. You are standing on your two feet and you're looking into the abyss and you're looking at God and you're saying, I am calling you a liar because I don't believe your testimony. That is very serious kind of thing, my friend. We need to be careful when we make such great Um, proclamations when we don't really know what we're talking about. Our perception of things is very limited. I've been listening to um, people, mostly politicians, talking about what is going to be happening with this COVID-19 thing and when we're going to be off quarantine and all of those things. And I've been listening and, and I listen and every other day it's something new. And sometimes it's the same person totally contradicting a thing that they said day before yesterday. Um, my my friends, our perception of the cosmos, Carl Sagan notwithstanding, is limited. And we only can see it from our small, myopic point of view from where we are. My encouragement and my, my, um, my, my exhortation to you is that you listen to the testimony of God. And we need to listen to what the testimony that God has given us for the Son. If you don't believe what the Father has said about Jesus, you're calling the Father a liar. And I think that we need to ponder that for just a moment and let that sink in. 
So we've seen this evidence in our lives. We've seen this evidence about the, the, the testimony about um, our lives as Christians. And we started this, this sermon asking the question, are we living the life? The evidence in favor of it is that you're, you're born again. The second point of evidence is that you believe that Jesus came as a real man. The third point of evidence is you believe the Father's testimony about his Son. And so what's the conclusion based on this evidence and this testimony that has come forth? Well, John wraps it up very neatly in verses 11, 12. He says this, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. This eternal life that he's talking about here is in the present tense. This eternal life is something that is talking about what is happening right now. The present tense. It's not something that is looking forward as much as it is the quality of life that you have right now. Eternal life begins now, and he describes it very clearly in this present tense that you have the life right now. And you need to take, care, take hold of it right here in the here and now. You need to take hold of this eternal life, and we need to begin to live with the perspective that sees beyond the constraints of this time and this place and this world. We need to have a spiritual renewal in order to determine our course of action in this world. And we need to have a spiritual renewal. We need to have a revitalization of our lives based on the Spirit of God coming and us being regenerated and born again. And so I, I, I ask you to hold your life up to these evidences. Have you been born again? Do you believe that Jesus came as a real man? Do you believe the Father's testimony? And are you living that out right now? What does the evidence say if you weigh that against your life? John, in his gospel, in chapter 1, verse 12, he talked about what happens to a life of a person that comes to know Jesus. And he said this, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Did you get that? You must believe that Jesus died to pay for your sins and and died to fix that relationship that was broken with God. You must receive that gift that he's offering freely to all people of eternal life. And I close with this question. Won't you do that today? Won't you receive Jesus as your Savior? Now, what's his application to us today? If you've received Christ right now, and if you want to know what is going on with God in your life, I, I just have one thing to say that will, that will apply to everything here, is our beliefs about Jesus will define who we are. If you might ask the question, who am I? It can only be answered in the context of what are your beliefs about Jesus? Because as you think about God, that's what defines who you are. Here's what this passage of Scripture just says. Three things. In verses 1 through 3, it said that we are children of God who believe. We are children of God who believe. That's the first thing that we are. If you believe in Jesus Christ, it changes your whole outlook on things. You're a child of God who believes. It also says in verses 4 and 5 that you are overcomers who believe. Not only are you children, but you're overcomers. You're you're not just in this world where things are done to you, but you have the capacity to receive the things that are coming your way and to overcome them through the power of Christ and His Spirit who lives inside of you. And the third thing 
that we are is we're witnesses who believe and testify. We're children. We're overcomers. We're witnesses. That is who we are. That defines who we are. We are born again believers in Jesus who are children and overcomers and witnesses. And, and, and these are determined, these, these things in our life, this, this being a, a child of God and an overcomer and a witness are determined by the things that you believe about God. Children, overcomers, witnesses. It's a perfect progression of the life of Jesus being lived out through us. So my friends, as you're transitioning through this world, As you're living out your life from beginning to end and getting ready to step into this next world, whatever that's going to be. And and this can be in a a, a small way as, as leaving our quarantine or it could be in a big way as maybe getting ready to leave this whole world and this life behind. It's important that you get your thought life in order and your belief life in order. Because when you see yourself as a child who is overcoming and then is a witness to the world, that gives you a perfect progression of what you are to be doing on this world. And so we began this whole sermon with the question, you know, is, is you, know, <clears throat> you know, are you living the life? That is the life of God right there in three words. We're children, we're overcomers, and we're witnesses. Are you living the life today? If you're not, now is the time to make a commitment to live the life that Christ and that God the Father and the Holy Spirit are calling you to today. Let's pray together. If you'll bow your heads with me, let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning that we can come together and and have this encouragement from your word. And we ask, Lord, as we um, are, are speaking and hearing and thinking and doing all of the things that we're doing and feeling, Lord, are we, are, are, are we really in tune for your purpose for our lives? Lord, we thank you that, that through faith in Christ we are your children. We thank you that we are overcomers. We can overcome anything that is coming our way in this world through the power of your spirit that lives out through us. And Lord, we are witnesses of what you have done and are doing right now in our lives. We thank you for eternal life that starts now. We ask you for forgiveness of sins. We ask you for strength and power of your Holy Spirit. We ask you for transformation. And Lord, as that change comes, as we are transformed through the healing love of Jesus Christ as we are transformed then let us witness to our world what a great work that you are working out in our lives help us Lord to be who we are thank you for your love in Jesus thank you for caring for us so deeply Lord, I pray for this congregation that you'll watch over each family. Those that are struggling with sickness. Those that are struggling with maybe the loss of a job. Maybe those who are anticipating new life coming in. Lord, I I pray that you will watch over each family. I pray that you will mend relationships. That you'll strengthen their souls. Guard their hearts. And Lord, keep us safe until we can gather again together with each other and with you, Lord. And we we pray that you will hasten that day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church will sing out.
Sing it out. Oh, happy day. Happy day it is, church. May God bless you and keep you as you go out this week.